rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythm, just get down. Welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, Echoes of Festac 77 with Brother Abdul Akalima. Africa World Now Project is next. The use of form, colloquium, and festivals to center Africana intellectual and creative cultural production flows rhythmically alongside the long tradition of Pan-African tendencies. This historical continuity and our duty to move within its legacy is a project that the International Colloquium at the International Black Theater Festival that we, Africa Bolt Now Project Collective, have the pleasure to coordinate is the explicit dictum that guides its creation. Furthering our work in this Pan-African genealogy is intentional. With this, our 2024 offering examined the continued viability of cultural platforms through a critical exploration of these platforms. Our theme this year was titled Echoes of Festac 77. Attended by more than 17,000 participants from over 50 countries from January 15th to February 12th, 1977, the Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture was significantly the largest Pan-African cultural event ever held on continental Africa. It also witnessed the largest number of people of African descent to travel from the Americas back to Africa. Some during the time considered it a, quote, symbolic reversal of the transatlantic chattel slave industry. Africans from the diaspora were returning home. Notwithstanding the legacy of the crisis thereafter, the echoes of this momentous world historical event provides a lens through which we can look backward and forward. The conveners of Festac 77 stated that the, quote, heart of the festival would be the colloquium. As a result, for two weeks, January the 17th through 30th, more than 200 black scholars from across the African world gathered each day to read papers, engage in debate, and prepare reports on the following themes. One, arts and pedagogy. Two, languages and literature. Three, philosophy and religion. Four, historical awareness and five, science and technology. A quote from the Secretary General of the International Festival Committee suggested that, quote, the colloquium must mark an important date in the history of Black and African culture. From a study of its theme, Black Civilization and Education, we should draw conclusions likely to help us right now in improving our system of education, in making a new man, a new people, and a renewed society worthy and proud of the civilization they have inherited and capable of enriching and transmitting it. In this colloquium, it is not a question of proving that we have a civilization, for it has already imposed itself in the world, and no serious-minded person today can deny the existence, the originality, and the priceless values of Black and African civilizations. What we propose to do is to make a survey of the richness of our heritage and to draw therefrom the necessary resources for the revival of our peoples, and why not for the revival of mankind in general. The primary objectives of Festac 77 was to quote, provide a form for the focusing of attention on the enormous richness and diversity of African contributions to world culture and the opportunity for recounting the achievements of our ancestors. For the 2024 iteration of the International Colloquium, as we continue to think deeply about form and function and its relationship to critical consciousness formation and radical practice in the use of arts to map and proliferate Black African social, political, and cultural life, we had the pleasure of being in dialogue with Dr. Abdul Akalimat, who was at Festac 77. In fact, you will hear his presentation given at Festac 77 in this program. As part of a consortium of cultural workers, intellectuals, activist organizers, Dr. Abdullah Kalimat, along with Dr. Ronald Walters, Dr. Mulana Karenga, and a host of others took part in the colloquium. For our purposes, 
and it is hoped that this airing will promote for you an intention to explore the echoes of Festac 77 and other past and current festivals as a basis upon which to examine the legacies of these spaces, to map the various radical advancements or lack thereof, and to set the parameters of current and future black art and artists and their objectives. Dr. Abdullah Kalimat is one of the founders of Black Studies and Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a lifelong scholar organizer with a PhD from the University of Chicago. He has lectured, taught, and directed academic programs across the U.S., the Caribbean, Africa, Europe, and China. His academic organizing trajectory stems from former chair of the Chicago chapter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s, to a prominent actor in the African Liberation Support Movement in the 1970s, to being a co-founder of the Black Radical Congress in 1998. Dr. Abdullah Kalimat's work has spanned over 45 years, punctuated with the founding of various institutions such as, but not limited to, the People's College, Nashville and Chicago, and co-founder with Vincent Harding of the Institute of the Black World, to name a few. His academic work has opened new paths of inquiry in Black intellectual and cultural life while guiding many students on their journey through academia and beyond. What you will hear next is Dr. Abdullah Kalimat's presentation given at Festac 77, which is available on his website along with other important material, and then Professor Kalimat's meditations on Festac 77, setting the framework and intentions for our engagement a week ago. I will be remiss to not highlight that along with Dr. Kalimat, we were joined by artists and cultural scholars from Nova Scotia, Canada, where they explored the continuities and the histories of people of African descent in Nova Scotia, Canada. We had the pleasure to be in conversation with Walter Borden as he presented The Last Epistle of Tightrope Time, a powerful autobiographical play and the story of Walter Borden's life, his life's work, and his letter to the world. An artist and cultural worker, Mr. Borden is an internationally acclaimed and nationally honored African indigenous actor and activist born in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. His activism spans six decades while his professional acting career is in its 54th year. He has performed throughout Canada, Europe, and the United States. We look to bring you his thoughts and meditations in coming programs on Africa World Now Project. Stay tuned. During the International Colloquium at the International Black Theatre Festival, held every two years in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, we spent four days expanding the scope and deepening our range of knowledge about historical and contemporary black life through a lens that centered Africana cultural production, thinking through fundamental questions which included but not limited to, where have we been and where can we go? These were two of the primary questions that grounded us to think beyond the limits of now focusing on creating an African future. As you prepare to engage this program, we share this meditation and hope that it will guide you as you share your time and energy with us. The universe of thought and ideas are the playground of Africana creativity. Black life lives with the fulcrum of the seen and unseen, constantly merging theory and practice, effortlessly creating, recreating through radical acts of remembering moving in and out of the deep well of Africana ways of being and forms of knowing. This is the essence of black cultural production, the production of life itself. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly. Yes, Mr. Chairperson, <clears throat> I have a paper here on black studies in the USA, but the logic and substance of this conference requires that I read some brief remarks written only last night. This too represents what we mean by black studies. Comrades, colleagues, and friends, I greet you on behalf of the Afro-American liberation struggle, a struggle which is merging with the workers' movement and all oppressed national minorities in the United States in a fighting united front against imperialism, a struggle whose aim is national liberation and socialist revolution, 
a struggle united with the countries, nations, and peoples of the world in their heroic fight for independence, liberation, and revolution. My first point concerns history. We fight over history because the ruling class has consciously distorted it to enslave our minds. We ask, what is the logic and substance of our historical process? Black people have struggled through three major stages of historical experience in the United States since the Atlantic slave trade. Blacks were held as chattel slaves in a system of production and social life that was an antiquated barbaric anomaly inside a growing industrial capitalist system. It represented the backward state of the slave mode of production and the vicious exploitation of capitalism's profit greed. After the Civil War in the 1860s, the quality of life changed little, but there was a profound change in the relations of production. Black people were transformed into a quasi-feudal people, and this represented the initial possibility for the formation of an Afro-American nation. Outright fascist terror ruled, and production was characterized by nearly forced labor. World War I and World War II pulled blacks out of the rural southern farms into the industrial northern cities. Now over 90% of all black people in the United States are wage workers, a solid part of the working class in the United States. Briefly, this periodization of our historical development in the heart of one of the world's most dangerous imperialist forces is a major step in our historical consciousness as it clearly points out our task as solid sector of the proletariat in the United States, our task as socialist revolution. While our cultural life has dialectically progressed in this same manner, we know that it is the political economy and the role of the state that controls and dominates our life that is in fact the most important consideration. Prior to the Civil War in the 1860s, it was possible for revolutionaries to have a strategy for a two-stage revolution. First, the destruction of the slave system, and second, the ultimate goal of the destruction of the capitalist system. But this, is, this did not happen. This is not what occurred. What did occur is the continuation of the bourgeois democratic revolution begun over 100 years previously called the American Revolution. And the function of this was to further consolidate the rule of northern industrial capital over the entire country. Now, after decades of struggle, after the revolutionary upsurge of the 1960s, we face squarely and courageously the fight for socialism. As Afro-Americans, we are a people who have at least two historical tasks central to our role in this colloquium and festival. First, the rediscovery and reaffirmation of our ancestral past to celebrate our African origins and our continuing struggle for survival in the belly of the beast of U.S. imperialism. In this regard, we reach out to the masses of our African sisters and brothers. Secondly, and however, the most important task is to affirm our unity with all oppressed and suffering masses of the world, to merge our struggle with the proletariat in our own country and fight a revolutionary struggle. So the main question facing Afro-American people in the United States is the unity required for socialist revolution in the United States. Moreover, we feel that while this is a festival of art and culture, the main point of unity that can and must be reached 
is a fighting unity against imperialism. <laughs> this is the lesson of the heroic struggle of PAIGC and the fallen great hero Amilcar Cabral. This is the lesson of Guinea, but also it's a lesson of Paul Robeson, of Claude McKay and Langston Hughes and many other men and women of culture that have emerged in the struggle, the long and heroic struggle of the Afro-American people. So I conclude these brief remarks by placing a challenge before this working group and before the entire conference, the entire colloquium, the entire festival. Can we place this struggle against imperialism at the heart of our final summary report, our message to the world, and define this struggle as the basis for creating a new world. And this, of course, means a new Africa. To quote an African leader, if you want a revolutionary culture, create the revolution, and the people will create the culture. Long live the unity of the peoples of the world. Unite against imperialism. Long live the African Revolution. It's called a poem for deep thinkers, and it was written, I guess, for deep thinkers, intellectuals, etc. Sky people coming down out the clouds, land. Then walking into society, try to find out what's happening. What's happening, they'd be saying. Look at it, where they've been dabbling in mist, appearing and disappearing. Now there's a real world breathing, inhaling, exhaling, concrete and sand. And they want to know what's happening. What's happening is life itself, onward and upward. The spirals of fire conflict clash of opposing forces. The dialogue of yes and no showed itself in stabbed children in the hallways of schools. Old men strangling bank guards, a hard Puerto Rican inmate's tears exchanging goodbyes in the prison doorway. Armies sweeping wave after wave to contest the ancient rule of the minority. What draws them down? Their blood entangled with humans, their memories, perhaps of the earth and what they thought it could be but blinded by sun and their own images of things rather than things as they actually are, they wobble, they stumble sometimes. And people, they be cheering a lot because they think the sky people dancing. Yeah, yeah, get on it. People grinning and feeling good because the sky people dancing and the sky people stumbling till they get the sun out their eyes and integrate the in-head movie show with the material reality that exists with and without them. There are tragedies, though, a bunch of skies bought the loop-de-loop -loop program from the elegant babble of the ancient minorities, which is where they loop-de-loop -loop in the sky, right on, just loop-de-loop, loop-de-loop -loop, loop in fantastic, meaningless curlicues which delight the thin gallery owners who wave at them on their way to getting stabbed in the front seats of their silver alpha males by lumping they have gotten passionate with. And the loop de lures go on, sometimes spelling out complex primitive slogans and shooting symbolic smoke out their gills in honor of something dead. And then they'll make daring dives right down toward the earth and skag cocaine money white out and crunch iced into the statue graveyard where Ralph Ellison sits biting his banjo strings, retightening his instrument for the millionth time before playing the star-spangled banjo. Or else... Loop-de-loop, loop-de-loop, -loop, up higher and higher and thinner and thinner, finer, refiner. Sugar laddies in the last days of the locusts sucking their Greek lollipops. Such intellectuals as we is, baby. We need to deal in the real world and BBB be, be, be in the real world. We need to use, to use all the, all the skills, all the spills and thrills that we conjure, that we construct, that we lay out and put together to create life as beautiful as we thought it could be, as we dreamed it could be, as we desired it to be, as we knew it could be, before we took off, before we split for the sky side. Not to settle for endless 
meaningless circles of celebration of this madness, this, this madness, not to settle for this, this, this madness, this madness, these, these yo-yos, these yo-yos of the ancient minorities. It's all for real. Everything's for real. Be for real. That's the song of the sky tribe walking the earth. Faint smiles to open roars of joy. Meet you on the battlefield, they say. They be humming, hop, then stride. Faint smile to roars of open joy. Hey, my man, what's happening? Meet you on the battlefield, they say. Meet you on the battlefield, they say. What I guess needs to be discussed here tonight is what side y'all gonna be on? Greetings, everyone. Thank you for uh, another year of uh, our yearly festival and welcome to the International Colloquium, which has been part of the festival for a number of years now, started by Sope Olalurian, Dr. Sope Olalurian, uh, with the express purpose to uh, explore, extend, and really have a critical engagement about African cultural production, intellectual life. Uh, how it extends beyond the Ader, how it extends through the Ader, uh, cultural life itself, arts in all facets. We will be in this particular room for the next uh, today. Today is the opening of the International Colloquium. Of course, most of you probably have already participated in the first part of the colloquium, which is the gala. I hope you enjoyed that particular part. That was the opening of the festival itself. But now we're getting down uh, specifically to uh, what is happening um, in Black uh, theater ac across the world. I mean, the International Colloquium is that particular platform where we come and engage in in-depth uh, exploration of that. What does it look like now? What did it look like before? But also, more importantly, what it looks like uh, as we move to the future. Um, this year, of course, uh, there our theme is called Echoes of Festac 77. Um, and those who know anything about uh, the cultural festival, particularly Festac um, in Nigeria in 1977, there was a lot of um, pomp and circumstance, as some people have said, but there is uh, critical, but also it was very, very important because there's reverberations, particularly uh, from that. And this year, we have the pleasure uh, to have Brother uh, Abdul Kalimat, Dr. Abdul Kalimat, who actually was at the festival, but also very, very engaged in long time organizing not only on campuses, but in the community. There's a long history there. Uh, he's a professor uh, emeritus from um, University of Illinois Champaign, a stalwart. Um, if you have studied Black studies uh, in any type of capacity, uh, he is one of uh, what is considered to be the founders are the major contributors to Black studies across, obviously, universities. But again, coming from um, a particular uh, tradition off campus um, and merging those two things. Now, I do know that there's a bio and everything available. This year, I actually took the time to, to actually map festivals and the use of colloquiums all the way back from uh, in the 1900s, first starting with the Pan-African Congresses, and then, of course, leading all the way up until today, looking at um, the Negro uh, Artists, the Negro Writers and Artists Festival in 1956, 1959, looking at the first arts festival. So I have that document. So what I will probably do is, is if you would like that document personally, um, I'll have something where you can put your email and I can email it to you. I do think it is available um, on the app. Without further ado, I would like to bring uh, Dr. Abdul Kalimat uh, to the podium and deliver the opening keynote for the International Colloquium for the week and set the tone for what we're going to be doing. Again, Dr. Abdul Kalimat. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, start this international theme of the colloquium by uh, sharing with you the slogan of the moment in terms of social justice, peace in the world, free Palestine. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction, uh, James, and let me try to earn that respect. We're here to think about echoes of Festag 77. 
As you heard, I was there, an active before and after Festac, and here I am today to discuss all of that with you. The slide here shows my website on Festac 77, where you can find full documentation of the festival. It's at alkalimat.org under the link called Websites. Festac 77 is the largest, most representative Pan-African cultural gathering before it and since. The gathering of over 1,600 participants from 56 countries was a historic activity. It deserves an evaluation some 47 years later in 2024. In this talk, I'll discuss these five topics. Festac 77 itself, dialectics of Pan-African cultural festivals, about African-Americans, conditions today, art and the challenges we face today. But first, a historic note. African-Americans became part of the African diaspora mainly because of the triangular trade as shown in this slide. Europe sent manufactured goods backed by guns to Africa and replaced African people captured into the transatlantic slave system into the so-called New World the Caribbean, North and South America, as a labor force to produce and send to Europe raw materials, cotton to feed their textile mills, and to feed their fancy sugar and tobacco. Millions of people were displaced from Africa and relocated to the Americas. This was the basis on how the US capitalist system built its world leading economic base with cotton, sugar, and tobacco. The slavery system in the US was driven by an ideological strategy to confuse and disorient black people in the US, to estrange them from Africa and force them into historical amnesia and the cultural orientation of self-hate. But in more recent times, two history-changing events reversed this. The Black Power Movement sprang into a mass force in 1966. This went beyond the integrationist impulse that Black success meant mimicking white people. Black people turned to themselves, also embracing their connections to origin, to Africa. The lead book in this process was Black Power by Carmichael and Hamilton. Then the African liberation movement took a major leap forward in anti-colonial wars of national liberation, such as in Guinea-Bissau, reflected in the work of their great theoretician, Amilcar Cabral, shown here. Now these two tendencies, black power, anti-colonial wars of national liberation, converged in the Congress of African Peoples held in Atlanta in 1970 attended by 3,000 people. This gathered together the cultural and political activists from the African diaspora, who later joined the convening of Festac 77. Now, Festac 77 was hosted by Nigeria. The head of state then was Olusegun Obasanjo. Nigeria has the largest population of all African countries. It has the largest spread of descendants into the diaspora and it has oil. It's important to keep this in mind because Nigeria could afford to host Festac and build facilities for it because of its oil revenue. In fact, it built an entire Lagos suburb and called it Festac Town. However, there is an environmental crisis because of how oil production in Nigeria has neglected safety, and the environment. To protect its oil profits, the Nigerian government executed the environmental activist Sarawiwa in 1995. So why Festac in Nigeria? Well, it's a major force in African art, from the traditional sculpture of many types, such as Benin and Ife, to the liter literary production of great writers like Chinua Achebe and Wole Soyinka and the musicians like Fela and Sunny Ade. The Orisha, or gods, of the Yoruba 
made their way into the diverse energy of the diaspora, including Cuba, Haiti, Brazil, and the US. So on the basis of cultural arts, Nigeria was an appropriate host for Festac 77. However, following Festac, there has been a crisis of global importance, just as important as Festac itself. The hundreds of documentary film reels about Festac that were taken. I mean, they filmed everything, but they've been allowed to disintegrate, having never been digitized for preservation. So the memory of Festac in its detail is in danger, even though Nigeria is fat with 10,000 millionaires and at least five billionaires. Festac Town was built to be middle-class housing. And it's now, let me just say, it's quite less than that. You can follow my train of thought here. But the memory of Festac 77 still shines through Africa and the African diaspora. Now, the U.S. sent one of the largest delegations to Festac. We came and left in waves since the Festac was a month long. All art forms were represented. African-Americans had proclaimed their African ancestral identity, but brought with them the distinctive cultural production shaped by their unique improvisational creativity. Uniquely, African-Americans came with what they had, but more than most came with a desire to absorb new energy, new aesthetic flavors, and to build closer ties with the continental cultures. The base cultural foundation for Festac 77 was tradition. Each country delegation came in national dress, playing traditional instruments, and of course speaking their national languages. Forms of political leadership were performed giving traditional African leaders respect. In contrast, however, the African revolutionary forces were not embraced as much by the living, by the inviting country, Nigeria. Complete African unity has always been an abstraction, but nevertheless, an ideal goal worth having. For example, in music, there was the celebration of such performers as in this slide, Miriam Makeba, South Africa, and Stevie Wonder from the US. Different but loved by all, embraced as part of the great diversity of music that unites the people of the world about black music. What was perhaps the most important happening was not even part of the formal program. People were housed throughout Festac town in national groups, but at night, cultural performers took to the streets and open spaces and then began to wander around. Without the unifying tool of language, only the music and dance, people began to mingle and join each other. That was the real Pan-African celebration unity through improvisation across all the ways of making music and performance art. I mean, you could, we were in these like, it was like apartment buildings. And you could hear all night long, off in the distance, the drums, the, uh, the, the, the sound instruments. Uh, and then within that traditional sound, jazz improvisation. And people were dancing and singing that was the, that was Festac. That was the meaning of the Pan-African cultural uh, experience. But like whenever black people gather, the unity was not without debate and the airing of differences. In addition to the performances and exhibits, there was a colloquium for discussion. Now the colloquium had hundreds of papers on all forms of art and culture. But at the heart of these discussions, there was intense debate about the freedom struggle, how to end colonialism, how to end imperialist domination, how black people in Africa and the African diaspora could get free. 
Here is a U.S. panel that brought together three different approaches. Ron Walters on the left, longtime professor of political science at Howard University, was the civil rights type of activist. Seven years later, he became the campaign manager for the presidential run of Jesse Jackson. On the right is Maulana Karingo, was a leading cultural nationalist thinker. He wowed the audience with his ability to speak Zulu and present an anti-colonial argument based on culture and identity. And in the middle there, that's me. I spoke about a militant anti-imperialist perspective as an activist in black studies. Our unity, however, was based on a common desire for freedom, but expressed in different views on how to get there. The U.S. mix helped us understand what actually led to Feshtak, the historical precedents that led to Feshtak in the first place. Now, Feshtak continued a long history of such cultural gatherings on a global level. The global process begins with a, fir with a form of cultural identity born in France called Negritude. In the 1930s, France was focused on producing an intellectual elite in their colonies, which in effect would be to turn people into Black French. Negritude was a reaction, an affirmation, a way of thinking about the unity of the shared experience of being Black in a white country. The first journal that brought these intellectuals, young intellectuals together was called the Black Student, L'Etudiant Noir. As young intellectuals from French colonies were being brought into France to study, Aimé Césaire created this journal, The Black Student. Leon Damas identified the journal as, and I'm quoting here, a cooperative and combative journal which aimed to end tribalization and the clan system enforced in the Latin Quarter in Paris, we ceased to be Martinicans, Guadalupians, Guyanese, African Malagasy students, and became one and the same Black students. Here's what Aimé Césaire said, and again, I'm quoting. Negritude in my eyes is not a philosophy. Negritude is not metaphysics. Negritude is not a pretentious conception of the universe. It's a way of living history within history, the history of a community whose experience appears to be unique. With the deportation of populations, its transfer of people from one continent to another, its distant memories of old beliefs, its fragments of murdered cultures, how can we not believe all of this, which has its own coherence, constitutes a heritage? Here are the three founders of the Negritude movement. Leopold Senghor from Senegal, Emir Césaire from Martinique, and Leon Damas from Guyana. Senghor makes their critique of the silencing of Africa clear. Quote, the civilization of the 20th century cannot be universal except by being a dynamic synthesis of all the cultural values of all civilizations. It would be monstrous unless it is seasoned with the salt of negritude, for it will be without the savor of humanity." End of quote. This became the basis of a global movement which took off in 1956. Now, a fourth leading figure in negritude is Alion Diat. That's a picture of the meeting that took place. And in the first row is Alion Diat. He founded the most important journal in 1947, Présence Africaine, and a bookstore that still exists in Paris on Rue des Égaux. In 1956, he organized the first international congress of African Black writers and artists in Paris. This also included African Americans, because in this photo, you would see Richard Wright, and over his shoulder, Horace Mann Bond, and next to him, John Davis. Now, debates at this conference 
challenge the African Americans to prove their actual ties to Africa. This reached such a high point of tension that the African Americans went out after this conference to form their own organization, AMSAC, the American Society of African Culture. Unfortunately, this organization fell prey to sinister engagement with the CIA. It became a conduit for US funding to support African culture initiatives trying to replace the influence of the French. Then in June of 1957, AMSAC, the American Society of African Culture, was officially set up by these five African-American intellectuals, the political science and civil rights activist, John Davis, the historian and social scientist, Horace Mann Bond, the professor of French and future American ambassador, Will Mercer Cook, the philosopher, William Fontaine, and James Ivey, editor of the NAACP's crisis. And then later, of course, Thurgood Marshall and Duke Ellington became leading members. That's Duke and uh, Senghor. The negritude forces gathered strength when Senegal became the first president, when, when Senghor became the first president of Senegal in 1960. After consolidating power, he called the first World Black Arts Festival. Negritude was aiming to be a global force. However, Senghor allowed the U.S. State Department to take the lead for the African-American delegation. The U.S. delegation, nevertheless, included such great artists as Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. While Black culture was definitely in opposition to racism, it was not explicitly a political statement against colonization and imperialism. But this was soon to come. The origin of modern radical politics in Africa begins with Nkrumah and the liberation of Ghana in 1957, followed by his All African People's Congress in 1958. Following the armed struggle that liberated Algeria in 1962, a Pan-African cultural festival was called in 1969. The global familiarity with the Algerian revolution was advanced throughout the world, and certainly for us as a generation here in the US, by a movie, The Battle of Algiers, made in 1966, which was the year of black power in this country. This was quite a lesson for cultural agency. This points to a political approach to a cultural festival they held in 1969. The Algerian government not only invited all of the liberation organizations and revolutionary forces, it gave primary organizational prominence for the U.S. to a storefront office of the Black Panther Party. Now, here in this slide, you can see Eldridge Cleaver and Emery Douglas of the party, the Black Panther Party, sitting with Algerian officials. Soon thereafter, three main contradictions developed. First, within the Panthers themselves in Algeria. Second, between the Panthers and the Algerian officials. And third, as Huey Newton, who had been in jail, was released, there became a contradiction between the Panthers in the US and the ones that had been in Algeria. But, regard but regardless of this, the black power shift in the US movement had a great approach, had a great appeal to a global radical audience. Now, here are two telling images from the 1969 meeting. Archie Shep, the musician, and Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael from the movement. These brothers are not smiling, nor acting like all is well. The attitude was one of struggle against formidable enemies. The cultural festival in Algeria, in Algiers, featured African revolutionaries. They were known by their famous representative, Frantz Fanon. Fanon died in 1961, the same year his book, Wretched of the Earth, was published and became a manifesto for revolutionaries everywhere. The role of culture was always part of the African Revolution, as stated here in this quote by Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau. And I'm quoting, the study of the history of national liberation struggles 
shows that generally these struggles are preceded by an increase in expressions of culture, consolidated progressively into a successful or unsuccessful attempt to affirm the cultural personality of the dominated people as a means of negating the oppressor culture, whatever may be the condition of a people's political and social factors in practicing this domination, it is generally within the culture that we find the seed of opposition, which leads to the structuring and development of the liberation movement. There have always been those who stress culture versus those who stress politics. But in any case, both are critical and very much needed. Now, these two tendencies, culture versus political, in terms of their foundational beliefs, have great historical histories, especially for African Americans. Here in this slide, on the top row, is a cultural identity group, Marcus Garvey and his wife, Amy Garvey, followed by Martin Delaney and Edmund Blyden. On the bottom row is W.B. Du Bois and his wife, Shirley Graham Du Bois, followed by Claudia Jones and George Padmore. These tendencies were not always at odds. When they have converged, major actions result, as both were vital motivational forces for the lives of the Black community. The last major convergence was 50 years ago in the 1970s. The anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, and anti-racist forces converged in the African Liberation Day marches by the African Liberation Support Committee. This was taken up by the U.S. activists, but reached the Caribbean, Europe, and Africa itself following the Organization of African Unity. Here in this slide, you see the 1974 march in Washington, D.C. Now, Howard University has a video of the great debate that took place. Now, you know, like conferences where people have panels and they like get 10 minutes or 15 minutes to talk, and there's always the expression, there's not enough time. In this debate in 74, every person had 45 minutes to say whatever they had to say. If you could say it, say it, otherwise shut up and sit down. We digitized those tapes and they're now online at Howard University. So you can actually go and hear the debate that took place in 74, very important. And I'm not saying that just because I was in the debate, I'm just telling you. Also in 1974, was the sixth Pan-African Congress held in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. In the big picture, you see the great Pan-Africanists such as C.L.R. James and Julius Nereri in Tanzania. On the slide are two African-American leading figures at this time. One is Howard Fuller at the top, then known as Owusu Sudoki from North Carolina. And below him is Amiri Baraka from Newark, New Jersey what they call the New Ark of New Jersey. This was a time of great political movement, increasingly moving a revolutionary current with a national liberation passion. Now here are two great examples. Walter Rodney was a Guyanese scholar activist with a School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS, PhD. He became a global radical force, advancing a radical approach to black liberation with his seminal book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and also Groundings with My Brothers. Rodney joins the discussion of national liberation and socialism, and I'm quoting, nationalism is a struggle for a whole people. Socialism is, is either an ideology or a new stage of society. Nationalism could lead to socialism or it could lead to capitalism. It could incorporate bourgeois ideology or socialist ideology. So that these things are not antithetical. It would be better if we framed it that way. The debate would be more profitably carried on if people said black people are of necessity engaged in a national struggle because that is the form of their struggle. And that what is critical to understand whether or not the ideology 
and the objective of that struggle is socialist, end of quote. Of course, Malcolm, Malcolm X, meeting African revolutionaries, like in this case, Malcolm meeting Abdul Muhammad Babu from Tanzania, is a major example of how he came to understand the global struggle against major imperialist powers. The generation of black revolutionaries got to know each other from the US to the Caribbean, to Africa, and then on to how the diaspora stretched into Europe. Now here we have Du Bois meeting with Mao of China and Babu again meeting with Che Guevara of Cuba. Black unity was hugging close to world revolution in those days, but today we're in a new crisis. War, climate, poverty, ideology, homophobia, and some who face a rising fascism. Now look at these pictures. Can you name the places? On the bottom is North Carolina. The top right is Detroit. The top left is Gaza. Today we live in a world of crisis. And all of this is expressed in our current politics. On these faces, we can make a summation of the past and the present. On the left, you see two people who are engaged in this current presidential politics. One at the bottom of the Kennedy family, who has now turned in kind of a nutcase and all the people in the Kennedy family have opposed him. And at the top, who is that? Everybody know who that is. But the three that you see on top of each other there, John Kennedy, Shirley Chisholm, and Jesse Jackson, they represented various flavors of possibility that existed. Today, we have these two black people on the right, Cornell West, and at the top there, Kamala Harris, as black representatives in the, uh, in the political process. Jesse, we have to remember, captured 6.9 million votes and won 11 states, seven primaries, Alabama, the District of Columbia, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Puerto Rico, and Virginia, and four caucuses, Delaware, Michigan, South Carolina, and Vermont. That's Jesse Jackson. He had a base in the black church and the trade union movement. And he was symbolically the first making a major run. Now, Cornell has more radical politics, but no base. Now, the case of Kamala Harris, the question is, but the question we have to raise about the Democratic Party and the forces that support them is, what will they do with the question of genocide being uh, created? I don't mean what they say, I'm talking about what they do. What's gonna happen with the blockade of Cuba? And what's gonna happen with the citizenship of the dreamers? And so many other questions. So on the one hand, we have to stop the fascism. On the other hand, we've got questions that are very serious questions about the future. But within this, cultural creativity helps bind us together, surviving and preparing for the fights to come. Now, there have always been cultural producers who have held high the banner of struggle for our liberation. Out of the 1960s, here are two of them, Gil Scott Heron and Nina Simone. We continue to cherish their music today and will continue to do so far into the future. The movement birthed them and will do so again for more to come during the next uprisings. Now, what we continue to have are the critical theoretical reflections of the, base, of the best cultural thinkers of the last revolutionary black arts movement of the 1960s. Here's what Larry Neal had to say. You know, there are a lot of people that don't get mentioned. The leading theoretician of the black arts movement is Larry Neal, quoting him. The motive behind the black aesthetic 
is the destruction of the white thing, the destruction of white ideas and white ways of looking at the world. The new aesthetic is mostly predicated on an ethics which asks the question, whose vision of the world is finally more meaningful, ours or the white oppressors? What is truth? Or more precisely, whose truth shall we express, that of the oppressed or of the oppressor? These are the basic questions Black intellectuals of previous decades failed to answer. Consequently, the Black arts movement is an ethical movement. Ethical, that is, from the viewpoint of the oppressed. And much of the oppression confronting the third world in Black America is directly traceable to the Euro-American cultural sensibility. This sensibility, anti-human in nature, has until recently dominated the psyche of most Black artists and intellectuals. It must be destroyed before the Black aesthetic, the Black creative artists can have a meaningful role in a transformation of society." End of quote. The key ethical urge is toward freedom and not merely a good payday. Of course, the market will always play a role in the creation of art, but if that rules uncontested by the intentionality of the artist, then capitalist commodification will render black cultural production to be of no more value than what we get on television. Need I say more? More briefly, here is what Amiri Baraka says about the role of the artist as a social force. Quote, the artist's role is to raise the consciousness of the people, to make them understand life, the world, and themselves more completely. That's how I see it. Otherwise, I don't know why you do it. After Malcolm was assassinated, Baraka wrote a poem called Black Art and ended it with this. And again, I quote, let black people understand that they are lovers and the sons of warriors and sons of warriors are poems of poets and all the loveliness here in the world. We want a black poem and a black world. Let the world be a black poem and let all black people speak this poem silently or loud, end of quote. We have to mention, whenever Black people move toward freedom, new art projects emerge. Now, recently we've been having a Black Lives Matter moment. These activists were marching and confronting power in the street, and then they claimed the streets as their canvas. The slogan, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, as street mural art forced the society to face its racist behavior, especially in the form of police violence. And this is not only in the US, but cultural oppression, expression against oppression, even exists back in Festag town as it declines into slum-like conditions. Given the crisis of Nigeria, it is clear that art will focus on freedom and breaking the symbolic chains of their oppression. So the struggle continues, aluta continua. This is what Woli Soyinka says as advice to all cultural, cultural producers in Nigeria, and I quote, I don't know any other way to live but to wake up every day armed with my convictions, not yielding them to the threat of danger and to the power and force of people who might despise me." End of quote. In sum, we are left with fundamental questions for all cultural production artists and culturally focused Black Studies activists. What is the Black experience? Can art and culture, cultural representation reflect its reality and not simply what others want to think or imagine about that reality? Given the oppression and exploitation experienced by Black people, what is Black liberation? Freedom. And how can we get it? Another angle on this is the distinction between form and function in all cultural production, all artistic creativity. Is it fair to pursue these interests given whatever form art takes? 
So here we are in this great international black theater festival with the Nigerian drama theorist, Biodon Jefu calls the truthful lie, the way of telling truths by imagined stories. What my comments have pointed to is to view these plays at this festival and elsewhere within this framework of how we think about the world we're living in, within the thoughts we have about what is the Black experience and how can we get free. We can think while we enjoy. We can think while we enjoy. Thank you. Take me outside, sit in the green garden. Nobody out there, but it's so okay now. Bathing the sunlight, don't mind if rain falls. That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. Follow us on Twitter at AF. W-R-L-D-N-W-P-R-J Instagram at Africa World Now Project Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media I'm your host and producer, James Pope The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of International media journalist, executive producer and human rights activist, Mouiza Muntali Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funa Ngonda Senior research, content contributor and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui Senior Research Content Contributor and Production Associate, Dr. Josh Myers. Content Contributor and Filmmaker, Kurt Orderson. Technology Advisor, it's Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies. And Creative Directors, International Creative and Artist Designer, Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Nail Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. Be intelligent.